just hooking up right there. Weinstein said you just take the batteries out. Is that what Weinstein said? Yeah. Uh, Weinstein said. Wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> that's what I heard. Yes. Weinstein. Flower. Epstein. Okay. Um. <laughs> Hey, um, real quick, feedback from Wednesday's uh, training, feedback from Wednesday's training or Friday's conference call. Anybody that picked up something, an adjustment that's made, an idea, nothing? <laughs> Samuel. What I, I like is I change the way you look at things and the things you, you look at will change. Yeah. And so I wrote about three questions in areas that I need to look at differently. Excellent, excellent. Warner, what do you think about that? Change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. I, yeah, I thought it, I think I think I feedback I spoke to you was like, like this week has been a lot of that, especially for me in, in the new the newer roles that we're all moving into. Mm -hmm. I think you start to look at it's funny, you Christopher always says this, the more you know me, the wiser I get. And it doesn't make more sense until this week where it's just like, oh, <laughs> everything he said, whether it be on the conference call, whether it be in the leadership PMs. Mm -hmm. They, it's like, oh, that's what he means when he says this. It's like a ha ha moment. So, absolutely. It's what he means by that. The longer you're here, the smarter I get. What he means by that is, how many of you have adult children? How many of you at one time became an adult children to your parents? I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah. Like when you were teenagers, your parents were like the stupidest people in the world, right? And then you get older and older, and you're like. Get their shit together. They're talking about right, but it takes you a while to sort of get there. Uh, so if you're still in the slavish, stupid as shit like stage of your career, just stick around longer. I get smarter. Okay, Emily. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, Sharon. I'm sorry. Uh, I really got a lot of insight out of what you were saying because I really believe now, as I'm older, like you were saying, you see things differently. And if you want to get to the destination that you're trying to get to, you have to start thinking out of the box. Yes. And seeing yourself there. Yes. So I got a lot of insight out of what you were saying. And, and matter of fact, that's great. Matter of fact, it goes both ways. Because remember, the Savior said in Scripture that there are some things that we have to behold with childlike enthusiasm. Right. So sometimes season maturity is a benefit as to our vision or our perception of the way we see things. At other times, it's a hindrance or a wall or roadblock that we need to sort of revert back to that child. And, and a lot of set, a lot of Wednesday's message was just about that of having a new set of eyes on an old landscape. So, yeah, for me, the breakdown of the hours in the day, I had to hear it three times now. But yeah. it's great. Yeah. <laughs> to see it as, you know, there's hours that we're wasting. You know, literally, everyone's doing it. Hours and hours and hours every week, throwing it away. I want you to write this in your notes, and then Grace, I'll, I'll get to you. Efficiency is the default mode of the universe. Efficiency is the default mode of the universe when it comes to time management. What's another way we can say efficiency is the default mode of the universe? When it comes to time management, let me give you another way of putting it that's less pretty. Um, busyness is the default mode of the middle class. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not middle class, but let's look at your income and net worth and then let's decide, right? It's not, it's, not a, it's not a shame thing. It's like we're trying to elevate our socioeconomic classes. So we need to elevate our thinking. We need to elevate our identity. We need to elevate the value that we're providing to the marketplace. That's how we elevate our socioeconomic class. It's not just about working harder. I, I've said for decades, the hardest working people in the state of California are working the fields this morning. Are they the wealthiest? No. So hard work's important, but it in itself is not the end all be all. The default mode of the middle class is busyness. We're all so busy, and we all keep ourselves very, very busy. And because we keep ourselves so busy, we trick ourselves into thinking that we're doing everything we can to get ahead. Because at the end of the day, it's like, man, I, got, I did so many things, and yet I still didn't get everything done. So because I didn't get everything done, 
my hallucination, my rest, my rationalization, the way I justify not getting everything done is I did everything I could do today. The question, if you want to elevate your thinking and elevate your socioeconomic stand, stand, status is, is did I get the right things done today? Not did I do everything that I could do, did I do everything I could do to get the most important things done today, to get my priorities done today. Because where efficiency is the default mode of the universe from a time management standpoint, or busyness, being busy, staying busy, you know, the fa my favorite, my favorite limiting belief slash affirmation for middle class moms of all time is a mother's work. Never do. Yeah. Try repeating that to yourself 10,000 times or tens of thousands of times. That creates a really empowering belief, right? A woman's work is never done. How does that make you feel? Go get them. Right? <laughs> it just sucks the life out of you. So stop telling yourself that. Successful women always get the most important work done. They don't have to get all the work. They have to get the most important ones done. This is true of successful men. Right? So, <coughs> efficiency, staying busy, is the default mode of the middle class. What's, what's the difference between middle class people and upper class, or middle class and world class, or wealthy? It's not a focus on efficiency, but a focus on effectiveness. Let's define the two. Efficiency, if you think of something being efficient, if you think of yourself being efficient, or a product being efficient, efficiency is this. How do I get more things done faster? That's what these are supposed to do for us. Phones and iPads and computers. How do I get more things done faster? That's what efficiency is. What is effectiveness? Effectiveness is how do I get the right things done? It says nothing to speed. It says nothing to quantity. It's how do I get the right things done? Can we take a little bit deeper dive on that? Yes. The key to getting the right things done is knowing what the right things are. They're not all equal. Here's why to-do lists don't work. When you have a to-do list, you've got a number of items that on the list look equal in value. There's no specific time scheduled for when it's going to be done. And there's no time allotted for how long we're going to allow ourselves to partake in getting it done. So it has no start time and it has no end time. And all tasks are of equal value. But to-do lists don't work. Now, do I use to-do lists? Yes, to brainstorm. I use, here's all the things I'd like to accomplish in my faith this week or over the next two weeks. Here's the things I'd like to accomplish in my relationship with my wife. Here's the things I'd like to accomplish for, uh, for my children or with our family. Here's the things I'd like to accomplish financially. Here's the things I'd like to accomplish in my fitness and nutrition. Here's the things I'd like to accomplish in my business, right? I, go, I, I create lists of all of the things that I want to do. Part of being successful, by the way, this is all bonus. What is it? Bonus. bonus. What does that mean? It was not prepared. It's not part of today's training. This is before we get to today's training. So if I come up with a list of 10 things in one of these categories of my life, how many of you have heard of Pareto's Law? 80-20 rule. Here's what I need. Here's what I need to do to be successful. Here's what I need to do to prioritize. Here's what I need to do to be effective. I need to figure out what's the most important things first. In other words, God bless you. If if I can only get 20% of my list done, in a list of 10, that's how many things two things, which two things could I choose to do that are going to get me 80% of the results that I'm looking for? Because Pareto's law says that 20% of the input creates 80% of the output. Pareto's law says 20% of the agents here did 80% of the production last month. 
20 percent of the agents here made 80 percent of the money last month 20 percent of the agents got 80 percent of the new associates last month 80 percent of the agents last month shared 20 percent of the income last month 80 percent of the agents last month brought 20 percent of the guests 80 percent of the agents created 20 percent of the appointments that's Brando's law in business. Some argue in today's society that it's more like 90-10, that it's more disparaging, right? Now, the good news is any one of you 80 can become a 20, and any of the 20 can fall and become an 80, right? <laughs> right? But to think that all 10 things on my list to get in health, to, to improve my health and fitness this week, or all 10 things to grow my business week, this week are of equal value, just isn't true. It's not true. So part of being successful is doing this, and it's hard for people to do, but when you practice it, it's a skill like anything gets better. Uh, this isn't one of those 20% of things that's going to get 80% of the results. Nor is this, nor is this, nor is this. Part of the game is eliminating things and be willing to let go of things and saying, I'm not going to get this done. And as much as I would like to, I don't have the time to. And even if I didn't get it done, it's not going to give me that big of an impact. Does that make sense? Yes. yes no? Yes. And then the other part of it is going, you know what? I think this, if I could get this done this week and this done this week, it's going to get me 80% of the results in this area done that I'm looking for. Now all of a sudden, it's not about being busy. It's not about how do I get more things done faster. It's how do I identify what are all the things I could get done? What are the two most important things to get done? What am I willing to eliminate, postpone, cancel, delegate, or allow somebody else to do? We, we talk about... Cash, we talk about the cash flow quadrant, and I don't have time to get into it if you're new and you don't know what the cash flow quadrant is, I'm sorry. But one of the big keys of going from self-employed to business owner, where more and more of your income comes from owning and running a business, is learning how to take many of these tasks and delegate them, and others, and eliminate them. But the challenge with doing that is some of these things I need to delegate. Well, he can't do it as good as me. He's not going to do it as good as me. I'm better than him at that. <laughs> That's not the question. The question is, can they get that done? Can they get it done to 80% as good as I could have done it? <coughs> if the answer is yes, then I should probably delegate it. There are some things that you just need to eliminate. You just need to let go of it. Have you ever had a day where at the end of the day you didn't get everything done on your to-do list? Oh, yeah. Have you ever had a week where at the end of the week you didn't get everything done that you wanted to? Yeah. Has, have you ever had a week where that hasn't happened? Probably not. In decades. So if we know in advance that I'm not going to get everything done anyway, wouldn't you rather be in control of choosing what it is that you don't get done rather than letting running out of time dictate what didn't get done? Because our natural <laughs> Proclivity is for us to move towards doing our, I want you to understand this, our natural orientation, yes, Kim, is not to do, to move towards doing the things that are the most important or have the greatest amount of leverage for us first. Mm -hmm. Our natural proclivity is to move towards doing the things that we enjoy the most, that are the most comfortable, that are the easiest. Yeah. And so then at the end of the week, oh, I got this done, and I got this on my to-do list, and I got this, and I got this too, but I didn't get that many results in this area of my life. But here's what we tell ourselves as middle class, it's not my, because I did everything that I could. I was so busy, I didn't, I, I, I lost sleep. I, like I did, there's other things like I didn't get this done and I didn't get this done. If I only had more time, then I could have gotten more results this week. No. If I would have prioritized my schedule, if I would have chosen in advance that of all these things, these are the two 
I have to make it sure you get it done. And even though I really enjoy this, and this is fun to do, and this is easy, and it won't take a lot of effort, these are the things I need to let go of. You know what sometimes these are? Can I just go a little bit deeper? Yes. yes. Uh, organize my desk. <laughs> well, hey, if I'm going to have a great week, I need to organize my desk. And when it's on a to-do list, it's like, God, I just like it. My desk is a mess right now. I just talked to Evelyn about this on Friday. I go, I know this isn't normally part of your pay grade. This isn't what, what we said. Job expectations has had nothing to do with it. And so I really need your help in this area. And if you don't want to help me, I totally understand. I'll find somebody to do on Monday. Okay? Sorry, Tim. Tim's like way taller than me. He's like, ah, right? So like, no, I'll help you. I'll help you. She's wonderful. But here's the challenge with that. It's, it's something that I know needs to get done, and I start doing it. And what should take 15 to 20 minutes grows and becomes 90 minutes. And because it grows to 90 minutes, here's what we do. Here's the trick we play with ourselves. Do we want to just say, I just wasted an additional 70 minutes? I should have been able to do it in 20. I just wasted 70 minutes of our time. When you already feel like I'm doing everything I can and there's not enough time in the day, who wants to feel like they wasted 70 minutes? Nobody. So your brain won't allow you to do that. So your brain goes, here's what the brain does. It now assesses greater value to this than it really has to justify dedicating this much time to it. I, I had a conversation with somebody recently, and they played college sports, and one of their children is six, I think, and a pretty good athlete, <coughs> and they're coaching the kid's team. And I'm looking at where their business is and where their income is, and I'm like, like, that's not a very good choice. The rationalization is when you coach, you're the first one there, you're the last one to leave every practice, you have to wait for the last parent to pick up their kid, you're the first one in every game, last one to leave, you're spending time between practices, putting together a practice schedule, emailing everybody, get like all of this extra stuff. Well, because so much time is invested in it, now it becomes, well, it's because I love my children and I want to spend time with them. The majority of your time, as we talked about this, and this person was open to have, to getting feedback, the majority of your time isn't even with your child because your child's really talented. So you spend way more time with the kids on the team who are not as talented trying to help them get up to speed with your kid. And then you spend time preparing and you spend time lugging stuff back and forth. If you delegated this to somebody else, Literally, in about 10% of the time you're spending coaching, you could dramatically increase the quality of time that you're spending with your child and create much stronger memories, much greater experiences, and have a bigger impact on their career. But we justify it, and that's sort of the road that we go. Now, you may go, oh, that makes no sense. I, I don't have kids. I don't coach my kids. But that's how we do things. We spend more and more time on them, and therefore they become more and more important. So we've got to begin to look at what can I get scheduled and what can I not get scheduled. Does that make sense? Yes? Yes. yes. Helpful? Yes. Grace, you had a, a, a feedback or question or something to add from Wednesday. Oh, thank you for remembering. I um, I just wanted to say that. Part of my growth process. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, he talked about on Wednesday the vehicle, and we're in the car, and we're at the, we're parked. But we want to get to the intersection. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Yes. But um, I missed it. And so we talked about it again in the call. And that was huge for me because I use the vehicle as an analogy in my head all the time. Yes. So I was like, wow. So what he said is use the car, use the vehicle to take action. And don't just stay in the parked car. And so move forward. And so then I... When we finished, I was like, okay, I was very present on the call. I didn't clean my bathroom as I wanted to clean while I was listening. <laughs> <laughs> she thinks of me and she wants to clean her bed. <laughs> and so I wrote copious notes, even though half of the notes weren't in my book already. But it was so good for me to hear it again. And I, and I felt like he really dove deeper into it and elaborated a little bit more on the call. So I was really happy that we had the call. I was really relieved. And then I sent him a text to be accountable and said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. 
today. And, and I went ahead and I followed through and I did it. And one of the things that I, that I thought, because he does so much for us, is like, okay, he said he wants to be number one for Wealthful, so I'm going to call my four team members and I'm going to connect with them and I'm going to see who I can get to go to Wealthful because not only is it going to help him be number one, but it's going to help me grow my team, but really it's going to help my team member get the bigger picture and be able to grow and really see what this business could do for them. So I was able to get John Dilly to not only sign up for Wealthful, which he had previously done, but he says, yes, I'll get my hotel room. I'll book it now. And he went ahead and he did it. And so I took action. I did exactly what he did. And I got to the light and I realized, oh, action gets the results. So I did it. That was my example. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, the, so, here was the quote, and remember, I quoted the original person who shared it from Ed's podcast. I quoted him on Wednesday, yeah. and I quoted him on Friday on the conference call. So, so now Laura, I, I no longer have to give him credit. Now it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm so right? Now it's mine. Answers are the reward for action. Answers are your reward for taking action. It's when you're taking action that answers are revealed to you, which is what Gracie was getting into, right? What Sharon was getting into is the Marcel Proust quote, the 1920s French author, who said, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Mm. Wayne Dyer said it a different way. Change the way you look at things, and the things you look at change. Tony Soprano said it a little bit differently. More opportunities are lost, not by bad decisions, but by a lack of decisions. What's a lack of decision? It's staying in the parked car. He'd rather drive the car forward even going down the wrong street because it's going to give more information or make a better answer. So with those things in mind, here's the second part of the training. I want you to begin to look at this with new eyes. I want you to change the way you're, when you look at the information I'm about to share with you. And look at it as if it's the first time. That's the company that you represent. Probably the most recognizable building in all of California. It's one of the top 20 most recognizable names in the entire financial services industry. Look at this company. Part of Aegon, right? Half a trillion dollars in assets. Half a trillion dollars in assets. Warner was meeting with some lady the other day and she's like, yeah. Well, the company I represent is worth like $2 billion. He's like, yeah, that's cute. Uh, the company we were at work with is like a half a trillion. She's like, holy sheesh, right? I want you to stop for a second and look at this with new eyes. You're a representative of this company. My children represent me and my wife and our family. You're a representative of this family. This is the team that you play on. This is the company that you work with. They didn't hire you by mistake. You didn't sneak in the back door. We hired you on purpose. We're proud to have you as a representative of our company. I want you to represent our company with as much pride as we are proud to have you represent us. That's the new set of eyes I want you to look at this through. Uh, Groucho Marx, Phil, and a bunch of you guys are probably too young to know who Groucho Marx was, but Groucho Marx was a comedian back in the 50s, 60s, right? And he said, I wouldn't want to be a member of a club that would have somebody like me as a member. Right? It, what he's saying is, like, oh, the standards would be too low if they hired somebody like me. For many people in WFG, because of where their identity is, the way they see themselves, there's an incongruency of looking at this company, the strength of this company, the reputation of this company, the credibility of this company, and them saying, it must be a mistake that I'm a part of this It must be a mistake that I'm representing this company. I'm not so sure that 
right? There's a disconnect, there's an incongruency there. Does that make sense? And so I want you guys to look at this. We chose you on purpose. We're proud to have you as a part of the team and as a member of the company to represent us. Transamerica is, World Financial Group is, Synergy Financial is, I am. Own it. Own it. Right? You, uh, uh, my son walks into a gym, he's wearing his high school jersey or he's wearing his club jersey. He owns it. There's a little bit of swag, there's a little bit of pride, there's a little bit of team ego about it. You should have a sense of team ego and pride representing this company. These are just a few of the biggest companies in the industry, just a few of the companies on our platform. We literally have hundreds of companies on our platform. It's a who's who of the top financial services companies, the top insurance companies, the top investment companies, the top mutual fund companies, exchange trade, like the top companies in the industry, we have a platform that's chock full of them. What makes these companies <coughs> preferred? Can I tell you what makes them preferred? Yes. 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 Can yes. I tell you what makes yes. them preferred? Yes. yes. We allow them to pay us an inordinate amount of money to be considered one of our preferred providers. Um, Rick Gallegos will be here from Voya in the next couple of weeks. Ask him how many years it took before World Financial Group and Transamerica said, okay, we'll let you be a preferred product for it. They wanted to do it for years and years and years. They were willing to write the checks necessary. And it took us a while before they said, okay, we'll let you. Jim, it's not only the amount of money, it's how they pay us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't pay other companies that sell their products the way they pay us. They don't get advanced. Oh, for sure. For sure. So, yeah, the way they pay each one of us, you guys, to represent their products is different than they do. Like, we've had some people leave our company and go to other companies, and they're, like, shocked. Because we always say, well, like, yeah, we advance you all this money up front. Right when you send in the application, they go, well, if I'm working at WFG and they recruited me, then everybody must do that. And then they go to these other companies and go, oh, every, everybody doesn't do that. <laughs> I just assumed that was just, like, one of the pitches they were telling us. Uh, no, most organizations it doesn't work that way. Why? Because we have this tremendous buying power because we move so many products. But this is just a handful of those companies. You think about like nationwide, how I many tens of millions of dollars do they spend on branding? Every, you can't avoid their commercials anymore. No matter what channel you watch or what program, you can't. And they spend money to be a preferred product provider. They not only do that, they have whole special customer service unit dedicated just to our agents. They design products just for our clients based on our feedback. You are a part of our organization, this organization, that has that kind of strength and credibility behind them. If you choose... To accept that and play with that kind of team pride. We've already chosen you. They've already chosen you. Can you pick you? It's like being a, like a little kid on the playground and it's time to form kickball teams. And somehow you got chosen as captain. Are you going to choose you to be on the team? Right? Or are you going to go around choosing everybody else thinking that you're not good enough to be on the team? The fact that we recruited you or that we have a recruiting model says nothing about the quality of the company, the quality of the products and services, the quality of the companies that we have that we're in business with. For some reason, people think that because we're either not paying a salary or because you were recruited, that somehow this is diminished. It may be diminished in your mind, but it's not diminished in the minds of Prudential or Nationwide or Pacific Life or American Funds or, Ally or hundreds of other companies. It's not diminished in the minds of our clients. It's only in your mind. And so a continuation of what we were talking about Wednesday is I want you to look at this with a new set of eyes and realize, man, I, I got more going on here than I realized. Because sometimes we're focused on what we're missing. I want you to be focused today on what you got. What you got. Right? They say this is a month of like 
gratitude, right? I want you to really realize and appreciate what you got going for you like right now, right? Um, we've already touched on this. We take a non-traditional approach. We do it intentionally. It's not like, well, you know what? We wanted to be like Merrill Lynch or Dean Witter or Smith Barney or UBS, but they wouldn't let us or we weren't good enough, so we decided to do it this other secondary way. Uh, we were trying to build like a... Uh, a, a world-class deal, but instead we sort of offshooted the manufacturing to China and they got like some sort of replica that's not as good a quality. <laughs> it's not the way we did, did it, right? We, we, we chose to be non-traditional on purpose. Uber chose to be non-traditional on purpose. They chose not to be just another taxi cab company. Airbnb chose not to be just another lodging or hotel or motel company. We chose to do it differently with people like us to go out and share the opportunity and to share our company and our products and our services, our ideas with people like us. We're the most diverse organization in financial services right now. It's not even close. We serve the needs of a diverse community because we're as diverse as the community. We don't walk around. Here's what's amazing to me when I meet guys in the industry. A bunch of them. Now, some of them are really rich kids that grew up to be really rich adults. And their daddies put them in the right schools and had the right connections and got them the right job at the right firm. And then their daddy used their contacts to let them go make little sales and begin to build their career, right? But a whole bunch of people made it in the industry are just like you and me. And they figured out a way to be successful. And they had success in our industry. And then they walk around with this pompousness and arrogance like, well, Kim Johnson couldn't be a financial advisor. Right? Bill McLaren couldn't be a financial advisor. It's like, you were just like them like 10 years ago. Who the hell are you? Of course they can be. But there's this arrogance about, well, I have this knowledge and these skills and I'm this and not everybody can do it. Well, who says not everybody can do it? <laughs> who says not everybody can do it? Now, we may do it to different markets and different parts of the markets. We may have different licenses, but like, that's just such an arrogant, pompous way of the ego saying, I'm better than you. Here's what I'm saying, just the opposite. They're not better than you. You're good enough right now. You just need to convince yourself of that. How many of you have ever had children or seen a child before? <laughs> Only three dissenters. That's pretty good. <laughs> One of the greatest challenges that we have with children is trying to get children to see the goodness in themselves. Trying to get them to see their potential, their gifts, their talents, what makes them so special. We try as aunties and uncles and mommies and daddies and big brothers and big sisters. We try and pull that out of them. Because we see it clearly, but it doesn't matter if everybody sees it if they don't see it. Transamerica, World Financial Group, Synergy Financial, myself, the leadership team, we see that in you. But it doesn't matter if we see it in you. The question is, is can you see it in you? Can you see it in you? Right? And so we're not traditional on purpose. Why are we not traditional? Because in a traditional format, it's really hard to serve the needs of the marketplace in the way that we do. Middle class, lower middle class, regular people. It's hard. We need a distribution system that can reach all of those people and reach them faster in a way that's effective. And so that's why we changed the model. That works really good. Financial cornerstones. One is protection, two is growth, three is safety, four is tax advantage. Perfect world, you have all four of those. Perfect world, you have all four of those. Have you ever heard of a product that might be able to do some of those? I Okay. It's our flagship product. Is it the only one? Nope. No. Do we offer it only from one company? Nope. No. Is, it, is it the right answer for everybody? Nope. No. Is it the right answer for a bunch of people? Yep. Yeah. Should people at least learn about what their options are? Yes. yes. Do most people you know are, are most people you know very, very, very extremely familiar with the product? No. 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 Have most of them never, ever, ever heard of the product? Yes. yes. Then whose role and responsibility and opportunity is it? To help them learn about it. Ours. 
Is there a risk? Is there a, is there a possibility of market risk in your 401k or your retirement plan at work? Yes or no? Yes. 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 So let's just understand this. If the market, if you had hundred dollars in the market in your retirement plan at work and it dropped by fifty percent, like it did in two thousand and eight, or like it did it from two thousand to two thousand and two, your hundred dollars, if the market drops by fifty percent, becomes how much? Fifty dollars. So then, if you stayed in the market, which you wouldn't, at that some point along the line, you'd pull it out of the market and wait, you'd probably miss the next upswing, but you put it back in the market, let's say the market grew by 50%, how much would you then have? Uh, you still wouldn't be back to even. It's just basic math. Why? Because 50% of 50 is only 25. So we add 25 to the 50, we'd only be at $75. Chances are you wouldn't be in the market for all of that. Because people hide it scared, right? It would take a hundred percent gain to get back to evil. Here's a brief. Here's the things we do for families. We help them with cash flow, emergency fund, debt management, proper protection, building wealth, and preserving wealth long term. These are the financial concepts, and each one of these concepts has different products and services available that can fulfill that based on the individual client's debt needs or the individual client's emergency fund needs, or the individual client's protection needs. But these are the six sort of core strategies that we do it in. You look at the marketplace. <coughs> You've got 76 million baby boomers. The reality of it is this. There's about 100 million people today in our country that we would call baby boomers that are age 55 to 73. 76 million of them are born here. We've got another 15 or 20 million that have immigrated here from other countries that are in the same age demographics. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter where they were born. They live here now, and because they're 55 to 73, they have the same needs as the 55 to 73 year olds that were born here. It's not like, well, I was born in Romania or Guatemala, and so I have different needs for retirement. Really? You still need income for retirement, right? <laughs> you know, you still have long-term care needs. So it doesn't matter where, so that, that marketplace is even bigger. And then you've got Gen Xers and Millennials. So you've got another 112 million people who think differently about money, who think differently about careers and income. And I want you to just look at this. This is mind-boggling. Nearly half of all advisors today are 55 years old and older. <coughs> they expect a third of these people to retire by the year 2020. It says over the next decade, but then it says here by the year 2022, which is how far away? Two years. Two years. Leaving a shortfall of 200,000 advisors. I would suggest this. There's already an undersupply of advisors. Why? Because the current supply of advisors was largely based on serving the needs of the high income, high net worth clients, which is why we have so many companies that are designed to do that. We're the only company like us doing it on a massive scale, and where you've got the rest of the industry that's focused on the 20 percenters, what you're really looking at is a 200,000 agent shortfall for the 20 percenters. But there's never been an agency big enough to support the 80 percenters, and that's who we are. That's who we are. Here's what I would suggest. I've suggested this many times in a VPN before. We've talked about Uber. Let's say I told you over the next 20 to 25 years, Uber was going to be one of the greatest income earning opportunities in the country. And Uber was also going to give you a chance to earn passive income, residual income, and to earn like a top five type of income in comparison to other careers. And I said, over the next two years, Uber expects to lay off or have retire half of their workforce there's going to be a dramatic undersupply of Uber drivers to take these high income, high revenue positions that are also have passive and residual income. How many of you would be interested in a position with Uber? I would. It's a top five income opportunity. Like, let me learn about that, right? That's exactly what we're talking about here. But it's going to be, it's a top five income opportunity for who? 20%. Right? Because it's 80 20. Right? It's like one of the big talking points in politics today is that CEOs and executives are 
way overpaid and that workers are way underpaid. So this is true cross-sectionally throughout many, many industries. The difference is here is you get to choose. It doesn't matter who you're going to happy hour with, do you golf or not, did you go to USC, do you have that network, do you have an MBA? That, right, this year, were you born with a silver spoon? Does daddy have connections? That's not, not how we choose the 20% here. If you prefer going to a company, if you prefer working at a company, that that's the way the 20% are chosen because you were born with a silver spoon or you got the MBA from US, or like a, you should interview elsewhere because it really doesn't help you here. Here, you get to choose, I want to be a 20%, I want to be a 10%, I want to be a 3%, I want to be a 14%, right? You get to choose. And to us, that's a better way of doing it, right? Okay. This is the end of what we were talking about on Wednesday. You're an associate. How many of you are an associate with us? Training associates and associates, raise your hands. Training associates and associates, raise your hands. If you're licensed, <coughs> stand up. Okay. If you help four people a month, say $200 a month, we'll pay you $4,300 a month, ten ninety nine. dollars Four people a month, you help save a couple hundred bucks a month. Gracie, how much was this? Five bucks. Five bucks? So if you got one of these every day, it's 150 in a month. We're trying to, people do it. People can do people have a couple hundred bucks to spend? Yes. Are they spending it already? Yes. What are you trying to help them to get it to spend it on? Them and their future. So you help four people, not forty. This is an Amway, you help four people. <laughs> Save a, a couple of hundred bucks. Not on some product we're trying to convince you is better. Because Amway, right, they're trying to convince you that their version of detergent is better than the stuff you get at Costco for half the price. Oh, ours is way better. That's why it's 40% more expensive. No, we're actually saying uh, this is Nationwide's product that they sell in the marketplace. And then here's another version you can choose from. This is Nationwide products on steroids because they tweaked it and made it more cost-effective for our clients. You should get a superior product that you can save and invest in through a relationship with our organization. That relationship starts with you. You help four people a month, say 200 bucks a month as an associate with us, we'll pay, us, we'll pay you 4,300 bucks a month. Why do I share this? Because on Wednesday we talked about having depth perception. It, some of us, it feels like making two or three or four or five or $8,000 is a month is so far away from us. It's this close, four. Think of all the people that you know, all the people you come in contact with on a daily and weekly basis, whether you know them or not, know them well or not. None of these people are aware of products like an IUL where they have zero market risk, their money grows with the market, They're, it grows tax deferred, so there's this unbelievable compounding effect, and then they have access to it tax free. And it provides protection for them. So if they don't make it to retirement, the whole plan fully funds for their beneficiaries. What their 401k retirement plan at work could never do. If you're three months into a retirement plan at work and you die, guess how much your beneficiaries get? Three months of savings. Here they get the whole death benefit, right? Is it right for everyone? No, but you help four people a month save a couple of hundred bucks a month and pay you 4,300 bucks a month. Yes. Change the way you look at things, and the things you look at change. <coughs> I feel like I need to learn more to be able to do that. The answers are provided to you as a result of taking action. Not sitting in classes, listening to some bozo scream at you. Right? Answers are the reward for taking actions. I got to drive in the direction of identifying people who would like to learn about this. Do I, should I tell them everything when I meet them at Starbucks or in the church parking lot? No. 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 Should I tell them everything when I call them on the phone? No. no. What's my goal at that stage? Just to get a date with them. 
to have them come down here and be my date at this at the prom that we run here twice a week, <laughs> right? Or to have them set up a one-on-one -on -one date at their home or in my office. If it was me, you'd probably want to make the office a little, a little bit less creepy, right? <laughs> I don't want that guy coming to my home and on the first date, right? <laughs> <laughs> They've never heard of it. I, for me, my last year at Verizon, when Ed Milet sat down in my home with me and my wife, we were newly married. We were married in October. He sat down with us, I don't know, maybe a month later, six weeks later. And he started de describing an earlier version of this product that was not as good. You could lose money in it. But it had these incredible tax benefits to it. And I'm making $134,000 a year in a completely different industry. And I looked at just this one product, and I said to myself, if this is the only freaking thing they sell, I'll be rich. Why did I think that? Because I thought of everyone that I know, I don't know anybody that knows about these or has one. And if I just talk to everyone I know, I know there's going to be a, like, I get it, this is unbelievable the way this thing works. If I think it's unbelievable, I think a bunch of people I know will think it's unbelievable. I don't think I'm being fooled here. And the ones that think it's unbelievable, they'll probably refer me to other people, and some of them will think it's unbelievable. I learned that if this is the only thing they do, I'm going to make a fortune. The fact of the matter is, if you just help four families a month part-time with this, we'll pay you over four grand a month, plus the residual component. You get into a supervisory position. Everybody makes a big, uh, I want to change the way you look at things. Everybody makes a big deal of senior marketing director. Here's the reality of it. <coughs> We've got roughly 5,500 senior marketing directors in the company. 5,500, rough number, active senior marketing directors. We only have about 40, 45,000 licensed agents in the whole company. What does that mean? About one out of nine is a senior marketing director. About 20% are senior marketing directors. That's what it tells you. It's sort of that 80-20 rule we were talking about earlier. <laughs> so, do you have to be number one at something to be a senior marketing director? No. 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 Have you ever in your entire life on Little League in a church choir, uh, at the Sandy Hawkins dance in the dance-off, in some sort of job that you had, have you ever felt like, I'm sort of in the top 20% of this group of people? Yes. You ever felt that way at work? Like, I'm sort of in the time, not number one, but I'm one of the top people. Have you ever felt like that? Yes or no? Yes. So here's what I believe. That's who you are. That's your identity. <coughs> your identity says, I, I don't know if my identity, my self-confidence is strong enough to be number one, but I feel like I'm, out of five guys, I'm going to be probably the hardest working, most dependable, most responsible. Out of a hundred guys, I'll be one of the top 20. I might not be top five, but I'll be top 20. Because I can show up on time, I can work hard, I can be trustworthy, I can be dependable and responsible. Isn't that really what top 20% is? Top 20% is not like walking on water and changing water into wine, right? <laughs> right? Right, Lou? It's not like top 20% get to do that, right? Top 20% is you show up early, you stay late, you work hard, you're dependable, trustworthy, responsible, you're conscientious for others. It's top 20%. And here's what we do for you. A couple last things, because let me go a little bit longer today. Our average senior marketing director earns 80 grand a year with us. That's the average. That's not the top 20%. That's the average. Right in the middle. Right in the middle. Okay? Top earns 593. So what do you think the top 20% does? <coughs> well, let's give you an example. Uh, Jay and Ronnie got the A, are half a million dollar earners with us. They're not the number one SMD in the company, but they're an SMD, they're not an EMD. Matter of fact, they're an SMD that's life licensed and Ronnie's securities licensed. So they're somewhere in here. So they're not number one, so they're probably like top 10%, maybe top 5%. It's a couple you know, you'll hear speak on Monday, you hear pretty much on a monthly basis. They now have a podcast, you can hear more frequently than a monthly, like you've got access to it. They're doing it right here in our backyard, 
and can teach you how to do it. Right? Success leaves clues. Okay, so bonus material. Everybody say bonus material. Oh, bonus. Everybody say Shlema must love us. Shlema must love us. So nine beliefs that determine success and failure. Nine beliefs that determine success and failure. This is how you look at things, right? These are the eyes looking on an old landscape. The oldest landscape you have is yourself. What are your beliefs about yourself? What are your beliefs about yourself? You, Gracie and I were talking about this earlier. Your belief in yourself, your identity, the way that you see yourself is the single greatest, if we're talking about 80-20, The biggest lever underneath the 20 percenters that's going to move 80 percent is your beliefs about yourself. Uh, I don't know if that's true. There are people I know in this company that if you met them, they can't string a sentence together without sounding like an absolute moron. They're not very well kept hygiene-wise. They don't have very good skills. They would never graduate from our T3 classes. And they're making a half million, three quarters of a million, million bucks a year. Why? Because they sold themselves on them. They actually think they're that special. They're, how many of you know somebody in your life who, like, their self-confidence in your opinion greatly exceeds your identity for them, the way you see them. Anybody know somebody like that? Why is everybody looking at me? <laughs> that, that, sort of awkward, right? We all know somebody like that, right? Like, oh, who does she think she is, right? Yeah. Who does he think he is? It's a better question to ask yourself. Who do you think you are? Yeah, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Who should you think you are? You know who I would suggest you should think you are? Uh, you're a son or daughter of the King of Kings. That's it. Right? Amen. The blood that courses through your veins is royalty. That's who I think you should think you are. You're made in his image. So there's nothing wrong with your image. Whether you're tall or short, young or old, no matter what color your skin is. Nothing wrong with your image, you're making his image. So, how should you be looking at yourself? Like, think about once again how you look at your children or your nieces and nephews, right? They can make mistakes, they can have bad behavior, you're still gonna love them. Right, Silton? Right. Sean has made a couple in his lifetime, I'm guessing. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Just a few. Yeah. You guys still love them, sort of? Right? <laughs> Despite, like, like, they're, like, for my children, I tell them all the time, like, there's nothing they could do that would cause me not to love them. Gracie and I were talking about this earlier. Like, if you have more than one kid, like, you love them all equally. You don't always like them all equally, go through different seasons. Some of them are easier to like, but you love them all, right? Thanks, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the son or daughter of the king of kings, he loves you the way you are. Exactly. So who are you to say he's wrong and not love yourself in a similar fashion, right? So your beliefs about yourself are huge. Whether you're good enough, whether you're deserving, whether you're worthy, these are all things, right? We're talking about beliefs about ourselves, our self-esteem, our self-confidence, our self-worth. You begin to shift these things, <coughs> and everything else we've talked about shifts dramatically. Train the trainer is unbelievable because you need to work on your skills. What's a bigger lever is this. And that's why we talk 80%. I don't know if I'll get to this later in my notes, so I don't think I'll get to it. 80% of winning, not just in WFG, not just in business, but in life, is your mindset. 20% is the how-tos. 
It's the strategies. It's the skills. 80% of it is believing you deserve to win. Mm -hmm. Seeing yourself as a winner, not as a victim. Gracie and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, hit, Steve, hit the snooze button. Would you have to tell him five more minutes? All right. Sorry, Greg. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> if, you had, if, you were, if you worked your tail off to get a guest here this morning, or if a teammate of yours has a guest and you want to help them, help our guests make a decision that is good for them, please prepare to help our guests do just that. I'll just sort of wind up laying the plate. Gracie and I were talking about this earlier this morning. And Gracie was talking about an event in our lives that we share. So, do you mind if I share? Are you sure? Okay. So, Gracie was like, we have this in common. Gracie's like, I grew up without a father. My father passed away when I was four. Gracie's father wasn't really present in the home. And so, she's like, that same event that we share both helped us to have this we'll call it personality traits, or this characteristic about ourselves, right? But what I shared was, I think that's true, but that very same event in somebody else could have a, cause them to have the exact opposite personality trait. That's true. Can I give the example of like, somebody, go, two guys go to Vietnam, they're both captured, they're both prisoners of war, they're both in a prison camp for the same period of time, in the same space and everything. One leaves, he's a drug addict, an alcoholic, all the relationships in his life are continually ruined, can't hold down a job, and the other guy is the CEO of some big company, somebody really successful, she said maybe like a John McCain in the Senate, right? Mm -hmm. Same event, same experience, but two different, cause two different behaviors. So why is that? It has to do with how we label the event or the experience. How we label the event or the experience. There's a fantastic book uh, called Man's Search for Meaning. Meaning. Man's Search for Meaning. It's a classic by Viktor Frankl. Uh, and he was in a Nazi uh, concentration camp. And it's his observations about the people that survived and ultimately thrive in comparison to the people that didn't survive, and how they labeled those experiences differently, and how that made all the difference. So, here's the challenge with labeling the experiences. You want to know what the challenge is? Here's what the challenge is. The, ch the, ch the experiences that we most need to label are usually really messy. They're messy, they're dirty, they're ugly, they're painful, they're uncomfortable. And so, in the midst of our pain, our agony, our misery, in the midst of the messiness, the ugliness of the situation, can I come up with a label that benefits me and serves me long term? Because the path of least resistance is to label it the way the 80 percent percenters would label it and for it to have a meaning attached to it that is not going to serve me long term. <laughs> you're good, Bill, you're good, you're one of us. Thank you. right? This isn't church and I'm not on the altar, it's perfectly okay. <laughs> but when the basket comes around, please be generous. So, 80% is our beliefs about ourselves, and a big part of that is how we label these experiences. Beliefs about our prospects. That's why I spent the time today going basically through the BPM. Beliefs about our prospects. Do they need this information? Do they need to learn about these things? Can I provide value? Can I be of service just by sharing ideas with people? Whether they want to buy it or not is up to them. But my beliefs about our prospects and their needs and desires to learn the information, even when they tell me I don't want to learn the information. Right? Our beliefs about our responsibility. Whether or not my success is up to me or it's somebody else that is the reason I'm not successful. Is it my responsibility or is it shared responsibility? Other, it's my spouse, it's my kids, it's my job, it's my market, it's my leadership, it's my field trainer. 
People in the office, effort versus reward. Your beliefs about effort versus reward. Is it worth the effort based on the reward that I'm getting? Your beliefs about rejection and what re rejection really means. Is rejection a personal attack on your self-esteem, your self-worth? Or is rejection simply somebody saying, I don't understand yet, I need more information, slow down, this is too fast, it's not the right time. Your beliefs about success and failure, your worthiness of them, what's required to get them. Like one of the things that drives me crazy is, it's sort of like that affirmations that moms have, is the affirmation of like, well it's a grind, it's a grind, it's a grind, it's a grind, it's a grind. I mean, you keep telling yourself that over and over, and then you're, you're manifesting your expectations of, <coughs> I need to grind. Do you need to work hard? Yes. But when you start labeling it a grind, like, it, 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 we almost take pride in the grind. Right. I want you to enjoy the process. Our beliefs about intrusion, our beliefs about discipline, our beliefs about prospect. You guys can put those in your notes, and you can talk about them at a later time. All right. It's December the 7th. My younger brother's 50th birthday. Yeah. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, I, we inquired about it, but I think they're going to do something in January. I think they're going to do something in January, so hopefully it'll work out with the Buffalo that I can drive up the fly out this week. He and I have gotten a chance. He and I have gotten a chance. We've gone to Hawaii a bunch of times together. We've been in Lisbon, Portugal, Barcelona, Spain. Like, we've been able to do some crazy stuff together. World Series games, concerts, <laughs> like you know, weddings, baptisms, funerals, you know, we've been together. So I hope that I'll be able to make it back. Change the way you look at things. The things that you look at change. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but seeing the existing landscape, this opportunity to help people, to serve people, to share ideas, to make a difference, to connect with prospects, and help them to learn new ideas, seeing the same landscape <coughs> with a new set of eyes. Answers are the reward when you take an action in these areas. More opportunities are lost, not by making a bad decision. We get in fear of making a bad decision when our self-confidence, self-esteem, and self-worth of it is low. It's okay to make bad decisions. Gracie and I were talking about that earlier. I made a bunch of them. I probably made more bad decisions than anyone in the room. But I made a lot of great decisions because I'm not afraid of making decisions. Decision making is a skill. The more decisions you make, the more good decisions you're going to make. So Tony Soprano said, right? More opportunities are lost not by making bad decisions, but by making no decision. Rush, 2112, right? How did he say it? When, when you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Still made right, right. So, so, yes. So, I want you guys to be mindful of that. I want you guys to do your best just to be self-aware this week. When you're at the church parking lot, you're at the Little League game, you're at the mall doing some shopping, you're in traffic, you're at Starbucks, you're meeting with family, you're at a holiday party, be present in the moment. Look at where you are and who you're with, whether they're the oldest and dearest and most important person in the world to you, or somebody you're meeting for the first time. Be present. Look at them with a the new set of eyes. What can I do to serve? How can I make a difference in whatever way possible in this moment? Okay. Have a great week. Let's rock it out. See you guys Wednesday. Woo! Woo! Woo!